Now it is my pleasure to formally introduce our moderator and our guest speaker. Our moderator is David Weinberg, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Judd Enterprises, Inc., a private investment management company. And David is a trustee and co-chair of the Foreign Policy Leadership Council of the Brookings Institution. He also serves on the board of directors for the Coca-Cola Company and is a trustee of Northwestern University and the Ravinia Festival Organization. And now our special guest speaker today is General John R. Allen, who currently serves as the eighth president of the Brookings Institution. And he's a retired US Marine Corps four-star general uh, he is the former commander of the NATO International Security Assistance Force and the U.S. forces in Afghanistan. General Allen is the first Marine to command a theater of war. So he is also a recipient of numerous awards, both U.S. and foreign awards, for his recognition of the work that he's done. And he is a permanent member of the Council on Foreign Relations, but definitely an expert on our topic today. So thank you both, gentlemen, for joining us. And now, David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Donna, and it's uh, such an honor and a pleasure to be here. The ties between uh, the Brookings Institution and Chicago go back over 100 years. Uh, Brookings was founded as the Institute for Government Research in 1916 as the government began to grow, and, and the Institute for Government, government Research was founded to help deal with those issues that arise from growth, budgetary and other management issues. It, Brookings' first big project was to support the creation of the Bureau of the Budget. And as it happened, the first, first uh, head of the Bureau of the Budget was a famous Chicagoan, Charles Dawes, who had saved City National Bank, was the merchant banker behind Pure Oil Company and many other Chicago institutions. And uh, the staff for the Bureau of the Budget came in part from Brookings. So Charles Dawes went on to be Vice President of the United States and Brookings went on to become the nation's leading think tank, helping governments and society deal with some of our most difficult issues. Uh, that role continues today uh, for example, the head of our metropolitan program, Amy Liu, whose family incidentally is in Chicago, helps uh, various Chicago institutions deal with some of Chicago's most difficult issues. So with, with that as background, uh, I want to turn to uh, John Allen to ask him uh, what this great institution, his, his fellow scholars and he are focused on in this very challenging new environment. Well, David, thank you very much for that question. It's great to see you. Donna, thank you for the invitation and for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, and it's great to be on the screen today with uh, folks from so many important organizations that have tuned in. And I'm really humbled at the opportunity to have the chance to uh, speak to you and to communicate with you today. Uh, I think one of the most important uh, roles that a think tank can play right now is to provide guidance to the most daunting problems that our leaders are are facing at this moment. Uh, Brookings went out on full telework on 13 March, uh, but from that moment to this, uh, the scholars have been enormously productive, not just in the products that they have produced uh, across the five major research streams at Brookings, which is economic studies, governance studies, metropolitan policy, uh, global economy and development, and foreign policy. Uh, but very importantly, in addressing the public writ large uh, through webinars like this one. But right now, uh, with all of that work underway, Brookings is going to concentrate on two very important areas. The first is to develop a series of recommendations, uh, design suggestions, for example, on uh, how to reopen America. Uh, this is a daunting problem, and it's one that is tied irrevocably uh, to public health issues, but there are really daunting issues associated with the mechanics uh, of reopening uh, across the entire 
uh, spectrum of the human existence in our country, but also around the world. And it is uh, front of mind with, of so many of our leaders in the United States and around the world, how do we begin the process of trying to recover something that looks like normalcy in the social fabric? And so Brookings is turning hard on that issue now, the idea being uh, to produce a series of recommendations and observations <clears throat> that can be useful uh, across, again, the whole sector of the human experiment uh, to guide this process of reopening. And then the other major effort that we're undertaking, one that will uh, follow in close sequence to this, is a blueprint for recovery. It's very important because as we respond right now to this crisis, in many respects, we're rescuing uh, elements of the American population. Um, and we're responding to the moment to moment challenges that we're facing. Uh, a little bit deeper in the timeline, we're going to have to think very, very seriously of what, about what the long term recovery will be, David. And in this blueprint, uh, we hope to offer again, uh, a set, if you will, of, of meta factors that will guide all of our thinking in long term recovery. But it's not just about recovery, it's about reform, it's about renewal, it's about thinking anew on some of the great crises that we're facing right now that gives us opportunities that we could not have imagined ever having uh, in this era. So Brookings is gonna be focused on those two areas, uh, reopening and recovery. And we're gonna put a lot of our emphasis on that now. So uh, thank you. Uh the, the world hasn't stopped while uh, we're dealing with the pandemic. The, the challenges that existed before uh, still exist, and to some extent, they're even more intense. Uh, one of the more difficult sets of challenges deal with our multidimensional, complex relationships with, for example, China and to some extent, Russia. Uh, with whom we need to cooperate on issues like pandemic and climate change, uh, but we are economic competitors and strategic rivals and potentially adversaries. How, how do we manage those complex relationships in this environment? Well, I think that's probably one of the most important questions that uh our leaders are facing today in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, let me take a step back though, as I answer that and try to provide some uh, overarching context. One of the most important things in the post-World War II era that the United States brought to the world stage uh, was global leadership. The idea that it could mobilize the global community, those willing to be mobilized, uh, to confront some of the greatest challenges we will have ever faced. Uh, the first, of course, was the whole issue of the Soviet Union and the idea of a geopolitical thermonuclear backed uh, intent by the Soviet Union ultimately to bring about the demise of the West. And then in the aftermath of the, the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, in the aftermath, the United States demonstrated frequently the kind of global leadership that was necessary during moments of real uh, crisis uh, or problems that could bring about uh, a coalition, if you will, either of the willing or bring together international organizations with the idea under U.S. leadership or in US, with U.S. partnership uh, to, to try to face and resolve many of these problems. And, and so we saw, for example, uh, under the last administration, uh, U.S. leadership, strong U.S. leadership uh, on uh, dealing with Ebola, uh, another crisis which happily was contained before it could become a global pandemic. And, and in many respects, it's because of our partnership uh, with the U.N. and the World Health Organization and the community of nations, but with U.S. leadership that we were able to do that. Uh, I was one of the key uh, leaders, uh, one of the key participants in the United States leading the global community in response to the South Asia tsunami in 2004 and five. You know, a quarter million people were dead within hours of an earthquake and a tsunami in that region. And the ability to bring together the community of nations to provide support to the 
beleaguered states of South Asia and along the Indian Ocean Rim could never have happened without the United States. And then I was very fortunate to be asked by President Obama to help him lead the global coalition against the Islamic State. The community of nations that came together to deal with this horrific terrorist organization. My point is this, uh, the US does two things. It, it has both the capacity to lead in very powerful and tangible ways, but it also has global reach. It has the capacity to deploy assets for the global good, whether those assets are financial assets for development or medical assets to contain a pandemic or an epidemic and keep it local, or even military assets in conjunction to deal uh, with our allies and partners to deal with the problem. That is missing right now. Uh, and here is an opportunity, if we think about this in a broader sense, the United States once again to stand up and to take uh, a sense of responsibility, not for the problem of the pandemic, but for the solution of the pandemic. And what's really important here is that as we work with the World Health Organization, and I hope we still continue to, I think you know, we may see this as a question later, that in conjunction with the community of nations, all of whom are suffering right now from this COVID uh, blight, that we can create a community response to this problem. First, to help those countries that are in desperate need of assistance, to focus and aggregate medical capabilities to perfect the therapeutics that are necessary just to get the people out of the intensive care uh, wards, and then to push very hard for a vaccine and I think very importantly in the context of a global coalition led by the United States to deal with this, to anticipate what's coming next. Because as we know from these kinds of uh, pandemics and we know from these kinds of viruses, they're not, they don't show up one time. We're expecting another wave. And that wave is going to cause not insignificant additional medical problems, but we're also facing a global economic crisis, the likes of which we've not seen in a very long time. Here, this crisis, this economic crisis, is going to inflict pain on the world's population in ways we've not seen in a very long time, almost across the entire world, to include the potential for famine, widespread, large-scale, debilitating famine. And so at this very moment, the United States could be leading a process of thinking at a global level on how we can secure food stability. Uh, for those parts of the globe that we know are going to have problems six, eight months from now or a year from now. We can be anticipating what that will be and working with the UN Food Program or the UN Development Program in partnership with them as we have in the past and as we ought to be doing now to prepare for this. So David, you asked a, a, a question and I apologize for stepping back, but this is the context within which the United States has traditionally operated in the world. It's the only country on the planet that can exert this kind of strategic global leadership, and we should be doing it right now. Now, with regard to the Chinese, look, it's a, it's a fraught relationship. It's always been difficult. But at Brookings, we've always sought uh, to find ways where we can usefully cooperate with the Chinese, recognizing that there are major differences. That's an authoritarian capitalist system. And we've got a lot of problems with their human rights record, and we should never compromise on that. But even during the worst moments of the Cold War, we could still talk to the Soviet Union. And there were still occasions where we could cooperate with the Soviet Union. And so even dif with the difficulties with Russia right now, and clearly the difficulties with China, here is an opportunity. Here is an opportunity where with the capacity to cooperate with them medically in the field of science, immunology, epidemiology, working together for a vaccine, working together to prevent uh, the debilitating effects of the second wave, working together potentially to prevent the famine that, that may well come. Look, this is a difficult moment and we've been spending a lot of time and energy calling each other names and it has wasted our capacity to focus. And coming together right now, the two greatest countries on the planet, the United States and China, along with our European partners in the EU, and bringing Russia in if it's willing to play, 
gives us an opportunity to, to consolidate and to create synergy from our capabilities that can reduce the net effect of this virus right now, prepare us for the future. And here's a lesson I learned in the tsunami. When we responded to the tsunami, the United States had very limited and I would say strained relations with Indonesia. It was not an easy relationship. Yet when we arrived in Sumatra, uh, organizing the world's response, in the outcome of that moment of horrific suffering, when we emerged from that moment, the relationship with Indonesia was changed forever. Here is an opportunity in a moment that we have never faced in probably living memory uh, of misery, deprivation, sickness, death, and the potential for much more for us to cooperate in a way when we emerge from this, our relationship could be very, very different and then ultimately very positive for the world. So that's how I feel about this. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, I think, very insightful. And I, I want to turn for a minute to uh, a more domestic issue, which is that uh, the effect of COVID-19, not surprisingly, affect the most vulnerable members of our society, even more than the rest of us, as terrible as it is for all of us. Uh, what, what needs to be done to soften the blow to get people back to work, to limit suffering, and uh, try and level the playing field a little bit? Well, what an important question. Look, the, the extent of inequality in this country right now is something none of us should be proud of, and all of us should be committed to solving. Uh, and as Brookings has written extensively on this issue, um, our black community, our brown community, uh, our tribal communities, this virus has fallen with an enormous blow on those communities for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, there are uh, physical reasons associated with their susceptibility to the crisis, diabetes, uh, other issues of malnutrition, etc. There are issues associated with their proximity to competent medical care, their capacity to even move to a place where they can get competent medical care. The blow of the economic debilitation we're all facing now fell with uh, disproportionate uh, effect upon those communities. And what we have to do is as we consider the, both the reopening and the recovery, we must carry those communities into the frontal cortex of our considerations to try to use this moment to resolve some of that inequality. For example, uh, and I've had the opportunity to speak this morning uh, to one of our senior leaders uh, at a state level. As we were talking, uh, she laid out a number of things that she thought was uh, an approach that uh, was going to work. And I, I really commended, we really commended uh, her for her uh, insights into how she can embrace these communities to try to carry them along to both give them advantage in the outcome, but also to ease the suffering in the short term. And some of the things we talked about uh, was uh, payroll protection, doing as much as possible to provide for payroll protection for those communities, supporting uh, the banking systems, which have frequently uh, been more targeted towards those communities and those businesses within our black and our brown uh, population sectors, doing what can be done to support those banks as these businesses try to get back on their feet. Supporting education. There's, there's going to be, at the state level in many places, there, there are going to be real temptations with limited resources to try to place resources in areas where there can be uh, obvious recovery. Uh, even though there had been intention prior to COVID to put real resources into those communities to try to reduce inequality. Uh, what we would say to these policymakers and we'd say to these leaders is, 
don't let this emergency distract you from your commitment to reduce inequality, because now those same instincts are extraordinarily important to try to reopen black and minority businesses, to keep the banking system that supports them on its feet, to continue to focus those resources which would support schools and healthcare in those areas, continue to do that, and in fact, in this moment, reinforce it. Because in doing so, not just in the short term can we reduce the effects of inequality, we can set up these communities for success in the longer term. And the one thing that we have mentioned, we mentioned it this morning, we mentioned it all the time, and that is as leaders think about the policies that we're going to pursue in reopening, which is in some respects a distinct act from the long-term recovery, they should be uh, critiquing their own policy process and critiquing very stringently their policy outcomes to ensure that those policies embrace uh, all of those people from those vulnerable communities that must be cared for because they were vulnerable before, they are enormously vulnerable now. We have a moral obligation to do what we can in this moment to take care of them and examining with a very critical eye our policy development process and policy implementation to ensure that those communities are taken care of to get them taken care of in the health sense to ensure that their education is secure and to get their businesses back up on their feet this has to be an imperative for our leaders now thank you i, I want to turn to a very uh more, more narrow question about the role of the u.s military uh, domestically uh, those of us who remember Hurricane Katrina uh, remember that very few government institutions covered themselves in glory, particularly in the early days. Uh, one exception was the United States Coast Guard, which kept helicopters running day and night beyond their rating. And the military generally is held in high regard in the United States, and people are asking, can't, can't they help us out? What what is the role, what are the limitations on the role of the military in this pandemic domestically? Well, let me, I'll answer it in two ways, because I, I think we, unless you're gonna ask me later about the, the global role of the military, but, it, but uh, I'll start domestically. Um, you know, happily, the United States has several layers of military capability. Uh, and in moments like this, uh, the layer to which we frequently turn first uh, at, is at the state level, the National Guard. Um, when I served in combat in Iraq and in Afghanistan, we frequently served with National Guard units. And I'm telling you, they're, uh, they are great. Uh, they are wonderful represent, representatives of the, of the citizen soldier. And they're always ready. And I think we have seen now as an American population that one after another, our governors have called on their adjutant generals, uh, adjutant, sorry, adjutants general to mobilize their National Guard. And they do it for a whole variety of reasons. For now, it, it's not about security. For now, it's about public safety. For now, it's about rescue. For now, it's about distribution and logistics. Because our National Guard forces are enormously capable of those kinds of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, specifically to support uh, our governors and the state populations. They're very good at that. Uh, and they, they've been called forth to do that. Uh, the next layer of the federal forces. And uh, it's not usual for us to mobilize federal forces inside the United States, but on occasions where uh, emergencies of whatever form they may take uh, exceed the capabilities of a state's National Guard, our options are pretty pretty slim, pretty few, and we're going to have to go to the, the federal force. And that can happen both by uh, moving active duty forces to a particular location to provide backup to a reserve or a guard force, guard force primarily, National Guard, or giving them specific missions uh, amongst the active force uh, to provide niche capabilities that have either failed 
or have been determined as being needed in quantities or in uh, original, uh, original need that only the active duty force can do. So for example, the uh, um, hospital ship, the mercy and the comfort, uh, those are part of the, uh, not the naval, the, the standing Navy, but they are part of the, uh, the ready force. But the individuals that crew that uh, ship in what is known as the medical treatment facility, the MTF, in both of those ships, they're active duty military. And they come out of hospitals and they're battle rostered. And that from day to day, they're doing operations in Bethesda or in uh, San Diego. And, and when we activate a hospital ship, this medical treatment facility comes together quickly and deploys with it. There is the first example. That's one example of where the president, as the commander in chief through the secretary of defense, very quickly mobilized medical resources for those hospital ships, but also deployed other military medical capabilities in New York City and elsewhere to set up field hospitals and take some of the burden off of our frontline medical professionals in our civilian hospitals. Uh, other things that we can do with the military, and we're already doing it, is we're moving moving uh, equipment, uh, moving necessary uh, supplies by military transport. Because it can move very quickly, and we can move globally to move supplies from one place on the globe to another, and then within the United States, we can move quickly. Plus there are sophisticated systems of command and control, et cetera. Plus our military is uh, well-trained uh, in operating in an area uh, that is infected, if you will, where you know, we train constantly on uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical threats. And so there is some modicum of training there that we can support. Let me just make one comment, though, that I think is important. And that is that uh, we watched this very closely at Brookings, and we not long ago wrote about this. And that is that the disease has taken its toll on our first responders in a way that, of course, every single one of us, it breaks our heart every day. And I don't think any of us go to bed at night on any day and not thank our good Lord uh, whoever it is we pray to, uh, for all of those folks in the hospitals and running the ambulances and walking the beat uh, for the purposes of public safety. The police, the firefighters, the emergency techs, the hospital uh, professionals, all of them are taking casualties right now in a military sense. I don't mean to make this a military conversation, but they, they are. And what's very important, we've seen this in other places in the world, that as uh, our first line of law enforcement begins to take casualties, become sick, uh, become uh, incapable of uh, providing for public safety. Uh, we're going to have to think creatively about pairing up potentially National Guard forces, law enforcement forces, just to maintain that presence that's necessary for the public safety and the public good. Uh, and we think that these are kinds of contingency considerations that governors with their National Guard forces or the federal force pairing up with uh, states uh, could also support as well. So there's a wide range of things that the military can do. And if you would like to later, David, I can come back to the, the, the global nature of, uh, of how we're reacting to COVID. Uh, why don't you con continue on to the global na nature, but you might say a word or two about the posse comitatus limitations on uh, regular forces and policing. Well, this goes back to the unusual moment when we when we began to deploy federal forces. Uh, in the aftermath of the uh, era of, uh, uh, of the occupation of the South, Reconstruction, after the Civil War, uh, we very specifically chose in the United States not to deploy federal forces again within, within the United States unless it was a, uh, a really serious emergency, uh, which would require passe comitatus, uh, meaning that the federal forces would be deployed uh, for special purposes within the United States. It was, it was based on posse comitatus that we deployed forces to the southern border uh, not long ago. Uh, so it's possible to do. It, that's why it's so unusual. We as a nation, uh, by virtue of our history, uh, have chosen not to have large standing armies garrisoned around the country that directly interact with law enforcement and the governance of our states. That's a very Im important uh, distinction between us and other countries. Our federal forces are, they're stationed all over the country, but they're very much focused on a federal mission 
uh, outside the United States, to the defense of the United States. Uh, overseas, of course, uh, I know that the Secretary of Defense, the, the Joint Chiefs, who are also the service chiefs, are very focused dealing with this. Uh, and, and even so, uh, we have seen some infections within our forces. Uh, this is, uh, we have a force that is well trained, well equipped, it's far forward. Uh, it is providing the missions that are necessary to deter our opponents. And if we're going to get the national testing system working correctly, it has to be for the United States military. It's not a large force. It's less than 1% of the population, and we rely a lot on that less than 1% of the population. But if the crews get sick on our ships, if pilots can't get in the cockpits of our aircraft, if battalions are immobilized because of the spread of the virus within our, the ranks of our combat forces, uh, if our logisticians can't provide for the kinds of theater and strategic logistics that we need, if the Coast Guard becomes immobilized in some form or another because uh, cutter crews or boat crews uh, become sick, we've got a very serious problem. And the idea of having a, com a comprehensive testing program for our military has got to be a very high priority. And I know that is for Secretary Esper, uh, our Secretary of Defense. So with that as basis, the challenge that we face right now uh, is of course, keeping the force healthy, uh, being able to recruit in this environment of telework, right? For now, it appears that we're gonna be able to make our numbers within the forces um, by telerecruiting. It's not what we wanna do, but you know, right now that's what we're doing. We're gonna see how that works over time. But training, basic training is uh, in some respects suspended. Uh, ongoing mission training uh, is also in some respects suspended. Large scale exercises have been uh, suspended to include global exercises. All with the idea of getting the sense of how, how we have to take the steps necessary to make the force whole and to keep it healthy. Uh, and these are challenges that we're going to face. But I think one thing that's really important and that is, I would be very clear, and I think we all are very clear, with those who would wish us ill in the world, the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, the North Koreans, if they think for a moment that they're going to be able to achieve some level of uh, advantage over the United States and our allies at this moment when we're all under enormous pressure because of this, that would be a mistake. Because our forces are well deployed, our troops are well trained, our weapon systems are quite lethal, and it would be a big mistake by our potential adversaries to think that they could take advantage of this moment, to take it to achieve some level of advantage over the United States and our allies. That's not a threat, it's just a reality. Uh, we're gonna do everything we can, I know from the secretary down, to keep this force healthy, keep this force ready, and to keep this force forward. Uh, and I'm very proud of those troops. Well, this has been a, a, a very interesting conversation. I wanna come in now with some questions relative to the comments that you've made. And right, uh, right off the comment that you just had, General Allen, um, when you and I spoke a, a couple of years ago, we talked about uh, the impact that Russia had on our uh, influence, the influence campaign on our election. Uh, and now I think we're, looks like China is using some of Russia's playbook regarding spreading propaganda and disinformation, including through social media and text messages, some of the text messages that went out earlier in uh, March regarding the Stafford Act, for instance, has been led back to China. Can you, um, can you give us some comments or, and also how do we think about detecting and addressing these campaigns? Well, this is a, this is a difficult uh, problem. I mean, clearly, we didn't take the kinds of steps. This is not a criticism. It's just a, a statement of fact. We didn't take the kind of steps that were necessary uh, to dissuade the Russians from 16 or 18 not to try to do this again in 20. Uh, and if we think that the Russians are very good at this, the Chinese are actually probably better. Uh, uh, and having now, if over the last four years, seen uh, what has become uh, of the interference in our electoral processes and our democratic institutions and direct interference in our, the American population. 
through very sophisticated, artificially intelligent micro targeting through social media. Uh, I think we're, we will be surprised not to see just the Russians and the Chinese in this. There are other malefactors in the world who have an interest in unsettling the American population. And right now, we are seeing an increase in disinformation uh, and interference at the social uh, media level uh, to try to both uh, pin the origins of the COVID virus on the United States uh, or to uh, confuse the American people, for example, on reopening considerations, uh, to pit one element of the population against another as being responsible either for their economic difficulties, et cetera, or their inability to have the kind of medical care that they want. This is, this is an awful moment, uh, just in absolute terms for our population, and it is being aggravated uh, by the interference by foreign powers and foreign entities uh, to make it uh, more difficult. Uh, happily, we have, I think at the, at the private sector level, we have pretty sophisticated capabilities to detect this sort of thing. Uh, I know that uh, our tech giants uh, are deeply engaged in doing this kind of thing to both detect, blunt, and block uh, their capabilities. Uh, I know that the President of the United States has, in fact, uh, ordered elements uh, of our cyber command uh, under the command of our, our great uh, General Nakasone, Paul Nakasone, not just to detect, but in some cases, in, in ways that we can't really talk about here today, not just detect, but push back in pretty decisive ways. But what's also important is the education of the American people. Uh, we have to do what we can to set the example for them uh, on how to understand what misinformation or disinformation looks like. That's a very difficult thing. And in a moment where we are so politically polarized in this country, I'm not gonna take one position or the other, but we are enormously polarized in this country. This is a breeding ground for the interference in the social fabric of the United States, our democratic processes, which is voting, and our democratic institutions, which define who we are as a people. And it's difficult in an open society such as ours to defend ourselves. So educating the population is important but also having the capacity both to detect at a private sector level uh, and to detect at a military and security force level and push back is very important. We should expect though that these state entities and non-state entities who include global criminal networks, uh, non-state entities such as some of the uh, jihadist organizations, it doesn't take much to gain a lot of experience and a lot of capability. Uh, in this, and we can expect that we're going to see some of that emerging uh, in the future. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. Uh, in this era right now, where people are looking to blame elements of the population or create scapegoats, the other thing that we are seeing uh, in the United States is the rise of white supremacist activity. And uh, not insignificant amount of white supremacist activity uh, in the social network. Uh, and this has taken, sometimes it has taken the form of violent acts against segments of our population. For example, uh, the Asian American population has been victimized as a direct result of this because of some really um, intemperate language, sloppy language by American leaders attributing uh, this virus to the Chinese. And in the aftermath of that, it generated enormous ch uh, Twitter and chat traffic uh, within the white supremacist organizations. We need to be very careful about that. That's an FBI issue. That's a law enforcement issue. That's a Homeland Security issue. And at the very moment we have external entities attempting to interfere uh, with the social fabric of the United States through our social media, we have internal entities, primarily white supremacist organizations that are gaining energy and purpose from this moment as well. And we have to be vigilant to protect ourselves. Thank you for that message because I think we had several questions about why are we as citizens usually in a time of crisis in a time of war we pull together and why are we so disjointed today and I think um, you've answered that well in terms of the amount of disinformation that's that's happening. So um, we're going to be coming up to our final question and I and uh, we have many, many questions, so perhaps we'll have you back uh, because we have a lot more that we can answer today. Um, but um, 
you did ask, you did make the comment about the funding of the World Health Organization. Um, what is what is your view on that? What is the um, what is your view on the alleged uh, bias towards China? Um, how do we how do we look at this as an opportunity to work together in a collaborative fashion, as you mentioned, to solve this problem? You know, it's really important that we all remember that we set up the World Health Organization uh, and many of the UN agencies, and of course the UN uh, was uh, shepherded, birthed, if you will, and protected by the United States and the five permanent members and the community of nations. And just as the World Health Organization has played an extraordinarily important role previously in other uh, medical matters, epidemics, potential for pandemics, sounding the alarm, sending medical teams, rapidly deploying medical teams to areas where they could be helpful. The United States has played a very important role in that. We've had American physicians and scientists embedded in the World Health Organization for many years. But there are other entities like that out there as well. The World Health, uh, World uh, uh, UNDP, UN Development Program, uh, and the World Health Organization, uh, and others like that, uh, that have been of enormous help uh, for the community of nations that were sponsored by the United States in large measure and ultimately operational. I, I think it is a very bad idea for the United States to cut funding to the World Health Organization. Uh, not because it doesn't need, uh, like all of us do, to think about how we can do better, how we can be better organized, but we don't cut funding because they said something bad about the president. And, and that seems to be where we are right now. Uh, we need to keep our foot in these organizations because what we discover is when the United States walks away from these UN organizations and the World Health Organization is in the middle of a pandemic to cut American funding, which is about 15 to 18% of the entire uh, take on the, uh, of their budget, to walk away from that in the middle of a pandemic uh, just speaks volumes about how we view our leadership in the world. Uh, and so there have been other occasions. We walked away from UNRWA, for example, which is a UN organization that provides support to the Palestinians in order to put pressure on the Palestinians ultimately to, to come to the table on the Middle East peace process. What we fail to remember is UNRWA, for example, funds most of the schools that have educated Palestinians for many, many years. The ones who want to come to the table went to UNRWA schools. So when the United States walks away from these organizations, do they think they remain unfilled? No. There are entities that will flow in behind us in these global organizations, these agencies of the United Nations, and where that organization then goes from there without a U.S. presence to guide it with a set of principles and a set of values, where that organization goes might be where the Chinese take it or the Russians take it or a collaboration of states of illiberal states that owe us and have for us no goodwill. So A, don't cut the money to the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic. And when you walk away from an organization like that, you should just expect that someone's going to come right in behind you and fill in. And if you can't stand who that is, then stick with it and work for reform. Don't abandon them in the middle of a global pandemic. Well, I can see why you've been such a successful uh, leadership gen uh, in your leadership role, General Allen, and your thoughtfulness. And I thank you. I wish we had more time to continue this conversation, and I think maybe we will continue it at a future time if you're open to the invitation. I'd be honest, uh, thanks. David, thank you for bringing us this opportunity. This has been truly an informative, insightful, and candid discussion. Uh, we appreciate the time. Um, to our members, we are always interested in your feedback, and we'll be sending a survey on this program tomorrow. And to all, please stay safe, stay home, and help out our healthcare professionals first line responders, and all those who are working on our behalf on that front line to fight this pandemic. Thank you and have a, a good afternoon. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Thank Dave. You. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye.